Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on sets today. I'm actually really happy to see so many bright faces after Data Night Out. I definitely didn't expect at least half of you to be here. So good job. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun today, I hope, talking about what is honestly my favorite analytical feature in Tableau. But before we do that, just so you also know a little bit about me, I'll start by introducing myself. You already know at least two things about me. Because you chose to come to this session, you already know that I like cocktails and I like bad puns. So that's me. And this photo, I chose this photo because this was taken at the last Tableau conference, Europe in Berlin. And this face pretty much is a good uh, summary of how I felt about sets more or less a year ago. I used to think a lot of this, that sets are just dynamic groups. I wasn't very excited about them. I didn't really understand the point. I didn't use them that much. But things have actually changed a lot since then. I get sets now. So just a few months later, by luck of chance, I got to finally be properly introduced to sets. And this is how I feel about them now. <laughs> I love what I can do with sets. And we're going to see a few of these things today. But well, this, uh, I hope with this to show you how relationships with sets can change and become better. But I'm more than just a, a guy that does Tableau and plays around with sets. I'm also a keen hiker. This photo is actually from when I joined Tableau. Uh, and I went up hiking in Seattle when I was in my boot camp at Tableau. But also, I'm a very, very keen baker. And actually, before I joined Tableau, I was taking an office job sabbatical working at the, at the bakery in, in Madrid. But more than anything, this is what I like to do. That's my dog. Her name's Flika. And most of the time, what I end up with, the, I spend most of my time just walking around and hiking with her. Well, that was enough of an introduction. Let's talk about what you're here for. Today, I really want to focus on two things. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the explain side. I want, uh, I want every single one of you to get out of this session with a very clear understanding of what sets are um, conceptually. And I know a lot of you, as this is an advanced session, will already be familiar with some of these concepts. But I really want to make sure that I get the baseline right. Because if you do understand how sets operate and what makes them great, you will be able to pick up the use cases that I'm going to show you and actually apply them to pretty much any analytical use case that you have. So I'm, I am going to show you a few very specific use cases, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to abstract from those and, and build exactly what you need to build. OK. I also have a few surprises for you at the end, uh, but I won't, I won't spoil them right now. So these are my three goals. I want to set expectations. That by the end of the session, you understand how sets work and how to use them, but also how to combine sets with other of Tableau's features. Part of what makes sets really powerful is the way that you can combine them and not using them on their own. And then finally, I really want you to see how you can leverage sets to, to solve very common business questions. OK. But in order to understand this, you need to talk about what sets are. Brief summary, sets are a way to dynamically group dimensions. But they only group them in two ways, in a in or out which means the result of a set is always a sort of a true or false. It kind of works like a Boolean. The, and this is quite important. When we start building calculations, we need to remember this. It also has a fixed level of detail. This is also really important to understand. When you create a set, you create it at a, a specific dimensional level. So every, every calculation that you build towards um, adding members of that dimension to the set will always be done at that fixed level. And that's completely independent of what's on your view. And this is also what, so part of what makes them super powerful. And also, um, and this is, this is important for certain use cases, a set is obviously always connected to a data source. So they, they're not like parameters, which sort of are their own data source in a way. Uh, sets are very much fixed. So uh, it's important to realize that for some of the use cases you might be building in the future. But that's all very nice conceptually. Let's look at the actual example. Uh, let's start with the dimension. Let's call this dimension country. It's composed of five different countries, France, Spain, Germany, UK, and Portugal. I guess you might have, guessed, um, you might have seen by now that I work based on our London office. 
when you create a set out of that country, you end up with just two groups, the ins and the outs. Some countries will be in, and well, some countries are just very keen to be out. <laughs> but more important than anything, there's no other option. Everything on that dimension will be either in or out. They can't just be ungrouped. They are in or they are out. So how do we know what's in and what's out? What, what makes that choice? Uh, there are three ways for that choice to be made. And the first one is just manually. Uh, as, a, as, a, an, as a creator, as someone that's playing with the data, you are able to just select marks and create a set from them in the moment. That's the, the more basic way. You can also base them on a condition. So for example, if we look again uh, on our, at our top five um, at our countries, two of them are the top two in, in terms of profit. And so if we make that what defines what's in, it means that then only the countries that fill that criteria will be in, everything else will be out. But also, since last year, uh, we kind of changed things a little bit, and we added the ability of do it through an action. And this is a little bit different from manually, because it means that the end user, the person that's consuming the dashboard, can just select a mark, and that mark will be in, and everything else will be out. So these are the three ways. We're mostly going to be focusing on the first two today, as that's the purpose of this session. But you'll see uh, at the end how things are also applicable to the third way. Just one last thing. When you define sets in different ways, they also have different properties. So if you define a set manually, it will mostly be static. Until you actually go in and edit the set, it won't change what's inside the set. Uh, if you do it through a condition, then it's the exact opposite. It's fully dynamic. As, as the new data is added, new data might, might change what's in and what's out. And also, as, as just different values uh, change, that calculation will always be redone. Also, through an action, it's also dynamic, because as your visualization will change as the data changes, the end user can also select different, um, different for example, countries to be in. I do like to call it dy dynamic-ish, because you, the end user do, do have to perform an action for it to move. So it's not completely dynamic. OK. So this is what uh, they are defined. After you have them, what do you do? So there's more or less three ways to use them. You can use the set in the viz directly, uh, a color, sort, using in rows or columns. You can use the set in a calculation. And you can even use the set inside the other set. So there's a lot of things you can do, uh, you can achieve with all three methods. For our session today, we're mostly going to focus on these, as there, there was another sort of more intermediate session just showing you how to use the set in the viz. OK, so this is it for our introduction. By now, you should have a very clear idea of what sets are and what they can do. But let's actually look at some use cases. OK, so first use case. I, it's a new financial year, and I need to select different customers for my, my own sale, the, the sales accounts that I want to keep working on. Well, sets perfect good way to do that. I have my list of customers. I can just go ahead and select the ones I want to have on my own specific portfolio. So if I select, let's say, let's just select a few of these. Let's say this is my hand-picked portfolio of customers. And I'm going to go ahead and just create set the easiest way possible. Just go here and create a set. I'm going to call this set my portfolio. Oi. That's it. Oh. <laughs> Having some spelling errors today. And now that I have my set, I'm going to start just by walking it around the viz. So option number one that we had, just bringing in, for example, into color, which is going to color differently the customers that are on my viz. Or I, can, I could bring it into rows and actually sort. I'll change all that into color as well. And actually sort by what's in and what's outside my set. Or I can even just straight on add it to filters, for example, and keep only what's in my set. So easily, just by dragging and dropping, I'm already able to achieve a lot of things using sets. But let's, let's change the level of detail. Let's actually get rid of customer name. 
One of the things that sets allows us to do is they'll keep that selection independent of the level of detail that you're showing. So this is a very easy way for me to compare, for example, how my specific portfolio is doing against everyone else. So actually comparing the ins and the outs. So let's just put that on entire view, and let's add a label. And now I can see how my ins and my outs corresponds to the entire sales volume on this data. And I could keep breaking it down without any calculation. Easy as that, I materialized my selection. I'm actually going to get rid of my, uh, the, my set on the viz. So I have one unique bar. And now that I have my set, I'm actually going to add it back. I don't have enough customers to make it large enough. Um, one of the things as well that it does is that because it's breaking up my view, even if at a higher a level of aggregation, it means that I can still do table calcs on top of them. So easy as that, I can add a quick table calculation for percent of total. And I can see that my portfolio just corresponds to 6% of all total sales. OK, this is basic sets. But this should give you a very clear idea based on what we talked about before on how you can build on top of that. And let's go to another example. Right now, we've only broken down uh, our customers by the ins and the outs. But actually, a much more common use case would actually want you wanting to compare your portfolio against everything. So what I'm seeing, what I'm showing you here is the average sales per customer in different categories of products. So how much, in average, is a customer spending in a specific category? And I would like to find out if my specific portfolio is doing specifically better at some areas or doing particularly worse at others. But I need the full idea of the data to do that. So this means that we can't just break down the data by the set. I need to actually use the set to filter down the data, but only filter it at the measure level, I'm not filtering the entire vis. But I'll show you how that can be easily done. So the calculation I'm going to show you now is actually the, the, one of the more complex calculations we're going to do today. And you'll see that it's not complex at all. But this is what this, when you're working with sets and using them in calculations, it will pretty much take the same, it will look the same all the time. So this is the most important thing that you can learn today is this calculation. So I'm just going to write all sales per customer. So because a set works um, as a Boolean, I don't need to compare a set with anything to get membership. I just need to write the name of the set, and then I can use that to filter this metric to just what's inside my set. So this means that it, if I call that sales for my portfolio, I can OK that, bring that into my viz. Oh, wrong place, right here. And now you can see that, add that into label as well, or else it's going to get confusing. First one. Change that to an average. Perfect. So what I have here now, actually, is on one side, the overall average sales, and one side, the average sales just for my portfolio. The set allowed me to filter at the pill level. And a lot of what we're going to be doing today is actually just that, using sets to filter, but keeping the focus of the viz exactly the same. I'm going to go ahead, change that into an average as well. Oh, wrong place. That looks better, actually. <laughs> and dual axis it, synchronize them. Now let's get rid of labels. And I'm just going to do a few changes to my total sales, change that into a Gantt bar and put them at the front. Oh. Cool. So what you should be able to be seeing now is actually compared in the Gantt, you see the, the total for everyone, the average for all the customers, and then the bars represent just for my portfolio. So this obviously allows you to quite easily, which is just a very simple calculation, actually ask advanced questions of a subset of the data compared to, to the overall side of the data. This also means that you can make calculations on top of it. 
I could very easily just bring both the total and also the, the, both the, my portfolio and the total and bring them, for example, into color. So if I bring that now into color, what I'm doing is I'm coloring by the difference to the average. So again, it's a very simple calculation, just comparing my selection to everything else. So this is what we call our sort of a benchmarking part to total. We've selected when we compare. What happens when you actually want to compare not to the total, but to another sub-selection? It's a very common use case. You have, in this case, two different portfolios of manufacturers, and you want to see how each one is doing in every single state for which we're performing sales. So right now, I just I don't have anything filtered out. I have my sets already created here, my manufacturing groups. You can see them here. But the way that I could use these sets as a filter, a normal way to use them as a filter, would not allow me to, to actually compare them. Because if I would bring the, my portfolio one here, it would definitely filter the sales just for my portfolio. But if I try to bring the second one as well, then I end up with nothing. Because I'm, I can't, there is no intersection between the two of them. I can't really compare them. So the way to compare these two, um, these two portfolios is actually to, again, filter them at the pill level, not at the vis level. Again, exactly the same calculation. I'm just going to go ahead and say that it's, it's my manufacturer group one, then sales. Again, should be fairly simple. I'm call that my sales for group one. So now that, that I have this first measure, I could actually replace one of the axes with group one. And so now the, this axis is actually representing the sales just for one group of manufacturers. So I can now actually duplicate my calculation. Let's go ahead and duplicate that, edit it, call that sales for group two. And all we have to do again is just change the name of this, the, the set that's being called. Perfect. So easy as that, I've been able again to do two filterings uh, at the pill level, none of them affecting the other. So now what I actually have is this scatter plot in which one axis is giving me one group, and obviously if the closer to the left and up um, my bubbles are, it represents a, that this group is doing better against the other. It's still not, um, I, could, I could help the visualization a little bit to make it easier to see the difference. And this is a pro tip for any scatter plot that you use. A very simple way to add uh, sort of a 50% line is to actually duplicate one of the measures and put it, them on the other axis so you can go down to that axis and just sort of remove everything with everything quite small, remove the label, and then add a trend line. So simply as that, it doesn't need, this is not specific to sets, this is specific to any scatter plot that you create. And then I can go ahead and dual axis this. Oh, I've actually. Synchronize my axis, make this one a little bit bigger. I shouldn't have removed that one. Yeah. So now, I have a much clearer idea of how both of these portfolios are behaving. So for example, for portfolio uh, one, I can see they're definitely doing better uh, in states like New Jersey, whilst for example, New York is, is, not as, um, is not a massive difference as New Jersey, but still is doing a lot better for the manufacturers in group two. Again, remember this will, be, this will be dynamic as the data changes, um, and this will allow you to easily add either manufacturers to group one or group two, or even change to any other portfolio you wanna see. So this is all I wanted to show you in terms of segmentation, and these three examples are what a lot of our use cases using sets might refer to. They might be similar to these, in which you're using a combination of just a set with a combination of a set and a calculation. So let's go ahead and just create some sets from scratch. So one other powerful 
um, opportunity that SETS brings us is the capability of find intersections uh, in a specific level of detail of the data. So a very simple way to understand that is thinking about customer segmentation. Let's imagine use cases where we, we want to find a specific subset of customers that sort of a, and apply two different rules to them. In this case, we're gonna, the rules we're gonna use, we want um, a customer that has a high volume of transactions, but also as well as high sales. So I'm gonna start by creating a set, and I'm gonna do it a little bit different now. I'm not gonna do my set by selecting. I'm gonna right click on customer name and create the set from here. So as you might know, this is the, the typical set uh, edition box. I'll call that my top customers per sales. And in this case, I'm not gonna select it manually. I'm actually gonna use a condition, or in this case, a top, but they function the same way. So I'm gonna use a top to figure out where are my top 25 customers, uh, 25, based on sales. So if I hit okay, I have my top customers per sales. Again, I could just easily see that by bringing that into rows. And I have them on the top, my top 25. As I keep scrolling down, I'll start seeing the ones below. Okay, so that's part number one. Let's do part number two. Let's go again and select our set. Top customers per sales. I'm gonna duplicate that and create another set that's gonna look at, gonna edit it. I'm gonna create another set that looks at the top 25, but not in terms of sales. I want them to, to be account distinct of the orders. So this will give me the number of transactions. So easy as that, I now have, oh, let me just change the name. So I have my top customers per transactions. I'm gonna bring that into my viz. And now what I have on the top is the customers that fulfill both criteria. But I'm still using two sets for this. Uh, and I, what I wanna do is just mat materialize one set that keeps running this through, uh, uh, throughout all the data. To do this is what we call uh, a combined set. I can go ahead and just select both of these two sets and create a combined set. When you create a combined set, you can define what sort of intersection you wanna see on them, sort of like if you want a full outer join or if you wanna just to share members on both sets. I'll call them my top performing customers. Click OK. And now what I actually have is the materialization, not, not of both of them, not, not of the both sets individually, but actually of just one. So I actually can de define my customers in this way to be able to separate them from all the rest. And I could keep on adding conditions that would dynamically update as the data changes. One thing I can actually do here as well is allow the end user to be able to benefit from this by not looking necessarily at the top 25, but allowing the end user to be able to define a threshold for when in relation to numbers of sales, a customer might make it into the list. So how can we do that? Let's go into our top customers per sales, and I'm gonna edit this set. And in this case, I'm actually gonna ignore my top and go changing into a condition. If you see here on the right, I actually already created a parameter called sales net worth, which will allow the end user to input a value. And I'm just gonna write that my sum of sales is bigger then my three, oh, uh, sales net worth. So what this calculation is due is gonna go to the level of detail of customer and see if their sales are at that, that level. So now, so my fixed, my, my combined set is still at play, but now I can change what I want to define in order to make that intersection between the two. So it's gonna only look at the customers that are high, uh, high volume of sales, and then the end user can define also in conjunction with that what's the other criteria they wanna use. So this is already allows us to go quite powerful, but we're gonna see some really cool um, other stuff as well. And now let's talk about using sets for using differential aggregation. And this is the bit of a funny word, differential aggregation, but it's Quite simply, it's just a way to maintain the, the information that you convey to the end user clean and concise without having to necessarily break down uh, the level of detail for everything. 
So in this case, what I'm showing is across time, the, the running sum of sales for just my top countries versus all the others. And a very easy, uh, the way this is working is actually just using a parameter to define what are my top sales. So I can see, for example, if I move it into top five, I can see that my top five states have done for most of my data have done better than all the others. So this is just, uh, right now, where all I've done is I've just created a simple set, st uh, set and separated my data by that set. But let's see how I've actually cr done that. So I have my set created. I'm going to go ahead and select states, create my set from here. And in this case, again, top countries. I'm just going to go ahead and add the top. And instead of creating it by a, a fixed number, I'll just add the top end states. The one I just created? No. That's the one. The top by our parameter. Cool. So now, if we have that, we can just bring that into color, and it will break down. Oh. I might have used the wrong set. No, let's have the wrong color. Okay. Now we're doing. That's right. Sorry about that. Had a bit of a issue here. So right now, what we have is just a comparison of our top. Sorry, did my calculation wrong. Let me just go ahead and redo that to make sure I get the message across. Let's go back into states. Let's call that our top and states. Again, let's go to top. And we want that to be run on this parameter. Now that I have that, I'll bring that into color. Have that in label as well. OK, that looks a lot more like what I, what I wanted to show you. So exactly in the same way, as the end user inputs this information, it will change the parameter. So that part's very simple. We're just allowing the end user to define what's in the top. But this, we can build on top of this a conditional aggregation using exactly the same approach that we did for the calculations before. And so let me just quickly create a calculated field and call that my country differential aggregation. And it's exactly the same idea. If it's in the top n states, then state. Else, all others. So what this will do is it will disaggregate and break up if the country is within those top five but it will just group all the others together. So if I go ahead and apply that, our country differential aggregation, put that into color instead, and put that into label as well, we actually see that we have, we still maintain that capability of defining the number of states we want to see of the top, but we break them down uh, consistently. We can even add another level on top of it. We can actually define how, how much are we willing to, uh, to disaggregate. Because we have quite a high number of states. So if the end user decides to select the top 30, we're actually going to end up with a bit of a crazy visualization. So we have a very simple way to define, to allow, the end, to allow Tableau to dynamically define if they want to break it down or not. So, I already created another parameter here that I'm calling the country threshold. And I'm just going to do yet another, this is a little bit more complex calculation, where I'm going to do a very, count, a very simple count distinct between, uh, between brackets so that it counts all the countries inside the set for all my data. And I'm just going to call that, I'm just going to use the same calculation in there. If top end states, then states. And this just allows me to count what's inside the set. So I get a final number telling me 
how many, how many countries are in this top that I've selected. And if I do that as bigger, Uh, sorry, I just miswrote my calc. Uh, so I want to make, uh, sorry about that, I <laughs> just put a bit of a brain fog. Um, so what I could do actually is compare that number with a country threshold, and I would, be, I would be able to define whether I wanted to aggregate or disaggregate, depending on the number of countries that have been selected. But um, I'm just going to go ahead and move to the next example. I'm having a bit of a <laughs> hard time remembering the final calc that I wanted to show you. And I really want to go ahead and show you this example, which is one of the most exi exciting examples I have to show you here today, which is actually using sets to define relationships in your data. One of the things I said in the beginning is that sets have this capability of maintaining a certain level of detail. And that is quite powerful, because it means that you can find how things relate at a level that's not necessarily uh, in your vis. So what do I mean by this? Uh, let's think, for example, uh, orders, a shopping basket. There would be different products in there, and all they share in common is the order in which they were, um, a order in which they belong to, that shopping basket. But in order for you to easily find if, same, if the similar product, if the same product is in the same order, it's actually hard to do that without breaking down the viz by order ID, which adds, adds a lot of information into your data. So sets allow you to quite easily make that calculation in a very much fixed level. So what do I mean by this? In this viz, I have all my, all my orders for all my different products. If, you, if using a parameter, I change to, I, I select the specific subcategory, I can see what percent of sales Across, the, um, across every single order also contains that same product. So if I, see, if I look at, for example, binders, bookcases, I can see what percent, let me just make sure that is, that should be table across. I can see exactly, let's do binders, I can see exactly what percentage of all the sales also contain my selected subcategory. So for example, paper, 23% of the orders that include paper also include all the other. So this is quite powerful. It allows you to do quite a lot of, of powerful comparisons using that. Not only in, obviously, market baskets, what things were bought together, but also well, customers' interactions. Well, what customer that bought in one state also bought in, a, in another state. So how do we build that? So I'm actually going to change to a different viz to show you how that would operate. And in this viz, I I'm breaking down my, all, my, uh, all my orders by the products that are contained in there. And this will allow you to understand the logic behind this idea. I'm now going to go ahead and create a set at the order ID level. So I'm creating my set where I want my calculation to happen. I'm going to select a category set, uh, order set. What I want this um, set to do is to be able to do, at the order level, identify if an order contains the selected subcategory. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to write that the category is uh, equal to the selected subcategory, so my parameter there on the right. So this right now is not working, uh, and is asking me for the formula to be an aggregate calculation. The reason for this is exactly to, to allow me to pick up of one value of, of one specific product in my order, pick up all the orders, uh, pick up all of them that are in the order. So to do that, I'm just going to max this out. And let's, I'll show you in an, as well how that, how that would work. So now that I have my selected um, category order set, if I bring that into color, you see let me select another one, like accessories. Uh, oh, uh, I made a mistake. Sorry about that. I should have subcategory in here because we're looking at the subcategory level, not category. And that would work. Yeah. So now, not only, obviously, every single one of these subcategories are being compared to my parameter, but only one of them is true. 
But because I maxed it out inside the set, it only takes one of them to be true for it to populate all the others. And that is the basis of this idea, the, of this relationship analysis, is that you max it out, that, that Boolean comparison, to be able to elevate that to all the elements of that order. So now, even if I go to a level of detail that does not contain that information, that does not contain the order information, if I bring that selected categories order set, it's a very funny name for a set, and I break it down, I, I, I'm still not breaking out by the order level, but I'm breaking it down by the proportion of the orders that are in the set versus the ones that are out. And then again, as I've shown you before, I could go ahead, let me just change the order here. I can add my measuring to label, for example, and I can even add a percent of total here. So add a quick table calculation for the percent of total, making sure that that calculation is done across so that it's comparing the ins of the set versus the out. And simple as that, I, I was able to, to allow for this dynamic comparison where I select, let's select binders again, and I see 100% of the sales obviously include binders, uh, but then there's a breakdown across all the others. I could even make this a little bit nicer looking by just filtering out my selected subcategory. And that's a very simple calculation. I'm just select a calculated field. I'm calling that a filter. And I'm doing exactly the same calculation I've done before. Where I'm calling my subcategory. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Subcategory equals selected subcategory. As you see, this I'm not uh, maxing it out now, so I'm not creating an aggregate calculation. So this will allow me to just filter exactly the ones that are 100%. I'll filter that to just the false. And now I'm only filtering the information from the one I've selected, so I don't have that extra bar with 100% that doesn't add me any analytical value. So this is some of the most powerful stuff you can do with sets. But there's one example that's quite interesting that I really want to share with you, which is when it comes to filtering table calculations. So if most of you have already tried to filter a table calculation, you might see that sometimes you don't get the end result you expect. Because when you apply a filter to a table calculation, that table calc will only take into consideration the information that's on your vis. So you, it, you, if you want to keep the context of the data, but just filter to that specific subset, then you have a problem because the table calc will stop working as you designed it. So in this example, we'll see how we're able to still filter a table calc and achieve just one uh, subset of the data without having to use a filter. So if you see um, in this, I'm comparing the rank of all the product subcategories. And in orange, I have the global rank. And in green, I just have the range within their own um, category, within, within all the only the data that has been displayed. So if I select a, subcat a category of products here, like technology, for example, you'll see that I can see that phones is still number one. And it's number one across all the subcategories, and it's number one across just the ones that I'm here. Whilst with machines, you can see that that value is different. So the table calc is still working fine. It's still doing its job. We just, haven't, um, we just didn't filter out the data to be able to show you. So let's see how we can achieve that. So if I, if I have a normal filter, which is what I have here now, and I go ahead and try to do exactly the same thing, you'll see the, the other behavior in which uh, different, by using the filter, we, we, the, our table calculation stops, work, stops working in the way we expect it to. So let's just get rid of our filter to begin with. And let's just go ahead and create our set. And in this set, we actually want to create a set from category, call that our category set. And in this case, again, we're going to use exactly the same calculation we've done before, in which we want our category to be the same as the selected category, number seven. So again, very simple Boolean. You see it's a little bit different now, because I'm not getting an error, as I did last time I tried to make this calc. And the reason for this is that I'm actually making this Boolean at the same level as my set. So I don't need to aggregate it, because it's exactly at the same level. Uh, it's always going to be true for one category. So I don't need to further aggregate it. I'm not at the uh, higher level of detail. 
let's go ahead, press OK. And now, if I go ahead and bring that into my viz in here, you'll see that now I have a comparison between the ins and the outs. And I can see where they rank across the just what's inside and across what's outside. So you see the, the table calc, because I introduced the set between before the table calc, uh, the, the second one, it's actually uh, meant that the table calc was updated to use the set as the pane as well. But more important than that, what I can do now is I can just right click on out and I can hide this information. So I'm not filtering, I'm just hiding what's not within my selection. So it means that I, for the end user, I get very much the same effect as I use with a filter. I can just select a category and the data will change. Uh, the, the visible data will change. Let me go ahead and also get rid of my header for the set. So you don't actually need it now. I've already hid what I didn't want. It means that as if I change the membership of my set, it actually keeps working fine. I filter it out. I'm only showing a subset of the data, but my table calculation is still working at the global level. This can be used as well when not, you don't necessarily want to filter to a sub subset of the data, but actually what you want to do is just update your table calc to work on a different direction, allowing the end user to themselves customize how they want the table calc to operate without having to manually edit the, the vis. So it can be quite powerful, especially when applied with, uh, with parameters. Yeah, that's exactly correct. I can show it again as well. All we've done is simply we've hidden, show hidden data. We've hidden the outs. Let me show the header as well. So instead, instead of filtering, we're hiding. If we filtered, then the table calc wouldn't happen. But if you hide, the table calc will still happen, but to get to the end user, you get exactly the same effect. So you just select your out, and you hide it. There are several ways you can do that. You don't necessarily need to do it by putting them on the viz like that. One of the simplest ways is sometimes just put it in color and then use the legend to hide it. But it, it achieves exactly the same effect. It's a filter without being a filter. So with, with these examples, what I really wanted was to showcase sort of the thinking behind sets and how sets integrate specifically with parameters quite well to be able to achieve this idea of sort of dynamic um, interactive analytics. But I have a few more examples I would like to show you about how with the newest releases, we we're able to make this dynamically a lot more powerful. So one of the things we released uh, last year was set actions. And set actions are what I like to call interactive analytics for all. It allows you to put in the ends of the final user actually the decision of what's going to be inside the set. And obviously, it might not seem like it's quite powerful. What's the point of allowing the end user to select what's inside the set or not? But the main thing is that it allows you to construct very significant behaviors on top of that interaction uh, because of the inherent properties of sets. So the main sort of the main idea of these new types of actions, like set actions and parameter actions, is that when the end user makes a selection, they're pretty much just storing that information in the set. They're not, the action doesn't do anything by itself. But using everything i just shown you before, by using the set in the calculation, by using the set in the viz, um, you can actually allow it to, to have the behavior you want. You can create any kind of behavior uh, based on your imagination and your technical skill in using Tableau. So how does that work? Let me show you a very, very simple example. And I'm actually going to use the first example we created, in which we had a fixed portfolio of customers that we created together at the beginning. But it's likely that after a while, there will be a user that would like to actually play with different portfolios and actually try and change and see how they would perform so they could be able to make better choices. Again. This is quite different from just filtering, because we need the full context of the data to be able to make informed decisions. So how do we do this? I'm going to go here into Dashboard. 
and I'm going to select I'm going to select actions and I'm going to add a change set values action. I'm going to use it based on our customer list and I'm going to affect the exact same set that we created in the beginning. So my portfolio which is just here. Uh, I'm also going to ask it uh, to remove all values from set from set when I deselect. Then I'm just going to click OK. And as you see now, if I as an end user select, let's say, four different customers in the beginning, you'll see that all my other visits changes to accommodate that. And it's very important to understand that here we're not just keeping that, inf that information of that the selection. It's allowing us to run calculations based exactly on what the customer has inputted, on, uh, sorry, what the end user has inputted. So it's, it can be quite powerful. It also allows us to do a, a few more fun things. Because right now, we could actually decide how we want to highlight to the end user this decision of what they've selected. Because sets can be used anywhere in your viz, you could actually just go straight to this viz, the viz they used to select, and just use my portfolio in color, for example. Or use that to sort. Or even use that in size. Let's take it out. That doesn't, that doesn't help us a lot. Let me go ahead and hide the header for my set. And this means that now me, as an end user, can just go ahead and, and hand select the customers I want. And because I've used the set, all these different behaviors are happening with one single click. It's being, I can compare my portfolio to all the others. I can benchmarking against the total. I can actually sort them so that they go on the top. I can change their colors. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening here just based on one single interaction. What else can you do building on top of this idea? Well, actually, you can build things like territory assignment visits in which you want to divide uh, the territories that you have on your market but you want them to be fair and you want them to have similar uh, number of customers or similar number of sales. Well, it's very easy to do that by using sets to dynamically group the end user selections. So in here, I can add a customer, to, uh, can add a market to territory A, have one on territory B, keep adding them in, and you'll see that my, my map changes to reflect that, but also my customer distribution and profit distribution changes allowing me to quite easily, as an end user, without having to do anything else, just be able to, to run those scenarios uh, in a very, very easy way. Oh, wrong, wrong one. OK, so what about things like market basket analysis? Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, having some technical issues on my side. But I would like to show you how that would operate in terms of the same example we've seen before of market basket analysis. So we were actually using a parameter to input the value of, the, of where we wanted our comparison to be made, so our actual category. But because of set actions, you can actually use the set to inform that, um, that selection so that if I actually select papers, the viz updates itself. I don't actually need the drop down value. I can just go ahead and select. So to do this, we're actually using a set in a set. We are using one set to store our selection, and we're using another set with a very similar calculation to what we've done before to actually uh, divide the, the bar charts. So how does that look like? So I, first, I have a set action at the worksheet level that actually all it takes is just inputs into one set my selection. So it's exactly at the same level of detail, is at the category, a subcategory level of detail, and, and takes out the, and stores that information that the end user uh, gives it. But then our second set, or order set, that's that one, that's actually taking a, a condition 
in which it's just maxing out the other set. So this might, again, it might seem a bit weird. Why, why would this just work with the max of the set? And the idea is exactly the same as we did with the parameter. With the parameter, we created a Boolean, and then we max that Boolean out based on that comparison, if the category was the same as the parameter, and then max it out to the entire order. But in this case, because the set is already a Boolean, we don't need to make any comparison. So maxing it out, it means that it only takes within one order, one category to be there, and the entire order will be inside the set. If none, if none of the categories are there, then they're out. And that's the idea behind actually maxing it out. This means that you can actually do even more advanced things. It doesn't have to be just looking at what products were bought together. You can actually see, you can actually allow the end user dynamically to see if a customer buys in one state and actually get a percentage of how much they buy in other states as well. So exactly the same logic in which you're passing out the relationship based on customer name, and you just move it across one, um, one state to the other without breaking down the viz by customer name. But finally, one last example I would like to show you is actually how, because with sets you're storing this information, how you can actually create quite interesting uh, and dynamic user interfaces. So this is what I like to call asymmetric drill down. And it's a, a common use case where you want to allow the users to drill down to a specific level of detail, but you don't want them to drill down across the entire data. This can be quite cumbersome if you have uh, dimensions in a bar chart that actually have quite, quite members within the hierarchy, so you want to make sure that they can only uh, open to one of them. So sets, sets and set actions actually really are, allows us to do that in a very easy way, in which me, now as an end user, can just select technology, and it will just open up, it will just uh, disaggregate the values that are inside my selection. So uh, in here, I'm using a set of category as well and an action to inform that set. And then I just have two of those two calculations similarly to what we build uh, with the top countries that then conditionally disaggregates that data. Let me just quickly show you how those calculations look like. So our first calculation just looks at the set membership and tells me that, it, well, if it's inside the set, then give me name of the category. Else gives me a plus. And this plus is exactly what allows me to have this detail here. That if something is not open, it just has the plus. If it's open, then it actually has the name of the category. But this only works if combined with another calculation, my subcategory drill down, we actually does sort of the exact opposite. If the, if the category has been selected, so if the category is in the set, then it's actually going to give me the second level of detail. But if not, it's just going to give me the first level of detail. And just as easy as that, it allows me to create this sort of dynamic interface that I, I, wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have been able to build if I didn't have access to set actions and allowing the end user to dynamically change what's inside. But think about this not only in terms of what it can do in a bar chart, but actually in any other types of visualizations in which you can actually easily allow the end user to play around with the level of detail they're working at. Perfect, so that was very much what I wanted to show you today. Uh, I was really keen that you would understand the ideas of sets, how sets operate, how sets work, why they are super powerful, but also that you'd see some use cases that you might be able to take home and rebuild and be able to, to uh, customize your own specific use cases. So I want to really summarize that this is the key message of today, that a set is pretty much just a way of storing selections. That's all, the, sorry, that's all that a set does. But uh, the way that selection is created can actually have very different ways. It can be done manually, it can be done through a condition, and it can be done through the action. And it's the combination of all three of these that makes sets super powerful. But then what you actually do with your selection is up to your imagination. You actually, as long as you can build that uh, interaction in Tableau with, the, uh, with what you've selected, you can build an almost infinite number of use cases based on that uh, one selection. And then finally, sort of the three main things we've been able to do here today that were quite powerful is to filter on the pill level. And this means that with just this very simple calculation that you can 
very easily memorize is that you can use that set membership to give you a specific measure. Or you can use the, uh, the, um, the exact same calculation to filter to a specific level of detail at the dimensional level. So this is quite powerful and quite simple at the same time. Also, you know what my PowerPoint's doing that, which is a bit annoying. Sorry about that. So one of the key things you can do with sets, uh, so the three first examples that I showed you are, are actually quite a good summary of what sets can do in terms of comparisons. Because sets store that selection, you can very easily benchmark sort of in, in these three different ways. The selected versus all the others, selected versus the total, and selected versus selected. And then finally, because sets operate at a fixed level of detail, you can do this relationship analysis in which you break things down and you compare them at, a, a, at one level of detail and you expose them at another. And the calculation will still be done at that level. So it allows you to filter relationships at a lower level of detail. So by show of hands, do you feel like by the end of the session, do you feel like you have a better understanding of what sets are? That's very good. Thank you. Also. Are you excited with the analytical potential of sets? That's good. And then finally, are you going to start using them as soon as you get back? <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that is exactly what I, I would hope you get out of today. If you have any questions, please come over um, and talk to me. But mostly, uh, I hope I've relayed the powerful nature of this feature. And hopefully, this will be you having sets on the beach. Thank you so much. <laughs>